Hi everyone, uh, I'm Abhijit from Georgia Tech. This is a joint work with Viva Vinit and Vladlen Kultun from Intel Labs. So single image semantic segmentation is a very popular topic and it's a very important one. So on high level, however, all the approaches kind of have a very similar pipeline. So given a single image, you pass it through your favorite classifier, maybe some cognets, and which basically outputs for each pixel an independent prediction of the semantic level. So given these pixel-wise independent predictions, you can then use them in a structure prediction pipeline, which basically assigns globally a semantic level for all the pixels. But what if, if you have a video instead of just one single image, how should be the pipeline look like at that uh, when you have a video? So the simple naive way is to repeat the single image semantic segmentation pipeline for each image independently. So you have per image unaries and you have per image structure prediction. But this is far from being optimal. So in this work, we propose a novel structure prediction framework for the entire video. So given uh, per pixel unaries, our structure prediction pipeline operates over all the pixels in the whole video and assigns level to the whole video jointly. And this allows uh, us to exploit context in much bigger fashion, not just restricted to, to the single image context. So structure prediction for single image has a rich history, starting from uh, grid CRF to high order CRF and to more recently fully connected dense CRFs. So what about video? How should the graphical model for structure prediction in video look like? Well, uh, the first thing we can do is to have a 3D grid CRF, CRF where each pixel is connected to its only uh, local neighbor, both spatially and temporally. Another thing that we can do is to have a, a 2D dense CRF spatially but still have sparse temporal connections like in the previous graphical model. However, in this work, we are going to use 3D dense CRF wherein each pixel is connected to every other pixel in the whole video. And this turns out to be uh, much more efficient and also gives much better accurate result. But let's now uh, briefly look at how dense CRF works since this will help me to allude to a very important problem that I want to convey in this talk. So dense CRF, in dense CRF, you minimize an energy objective composed of a data term and a pairwise term. So the data term is basically coming from your unaries. And the pairwise potential basically is composed of two components. First, you have a label compatibility function, which can be something like a POTS function. And the second component is basically a combi linear combination of Gaussian kernels. And these Gaussian kernels operate on some user-defined feature space. So uh, one thing to kind of note here is that the Euclidean, Euclidean distance between the feature space is actually acts like a weight for the regularization. So if you have, uh, so uh, the, if the features of for two pixels are closer, in Euclidean sense, then the regularization force between those two pixels are going to be higher. So the standard feature space that we are uh, we use in uh, dense CRF is something like bilateral feature space, which is five-dimensional feature space composed of the, the pixels to the image coordinate and the RGB color. And this enforce a, enforces a spatial smoothness but still preserves contours and boundaries. Now, if you have a video, you might want to add time as another component. So this will enforce spatio-temporal smoothness while uh, preserving boundaries. But are these naive bilateral space features good for semantic segmentation? But before answering whether it is good, but let's first articulate what is a good feature space. Right? So we want to list some particular uh, criteria that we want our feature space to follow. So the first criteria is that it needs to be low dimensional, no dimensional. The reasoning behind this is that the underlying filtering algorithm can only perform efficiently if it, the feature dimension is low. The second criteria is that the features for pixels below the same object should be closer to one another compared to uh, features for two pixels uh, lying on different objects. 
So as shown in this illustration, the, the green and the red pixel lie on one object, the car, while the blue pixel lies on the cyclist. So you want the distance between the green feature and the red feature to be smaller compared to the distance between the red feature and the blue feature. The another important criteria which is very important for video is that the feature space should respect correspondence. So we want the uh, corresponding pixels to be co closer in the feature space. So in this illustration we want the red pixels in the first uh, image to be closer to the red pixels feature in the second image. Same for the green pixels. And as you can see, if you use the naive bilateral space features, they do not respect the correspondence. That's because in any real world scene, your camera moves and also, also your scene changes. So that feature space doesn't really work. They're not closer to one another. So how do we get such a feature space which satisfies all these criteria? That's the main important problem we address in this paper. So let's first think about one solution. Let's say if you can do a dense tree reconstruction, and for each pixel, if you use its global 3D coin rate as the feature space, that can satisfy all these criteria because the global 3D coin rate is invariant to the viewpoint, right? But then how do you deal with dynamic objects? Also, you need camera calibration, you need to have pose estimation, so many other things. So can we do something which can work for any arbitrary monocular video? So, so what we do in this paper is to find a feature space basically by optimization. So find a feature embedding which respects correspondence. So the main intuitive idea is that uh, we want to find feature space by optimization using spatiotemporal regularization. And we use correspondence information coming from optical flow or long-term tracks. To give you an illustration here, so over this track in this video, uh, we want the features over all the points to be same or closer to the feature at the reference frame. So the final uh, feature space that we use is, is a result of minimizing an energy objective which has one data term. This data term is only defined over the pixels on the reference frame. And then we have a spatial smoothness term and we here use an anisotropic uh, second order regularization. And then we have a temporal regularization term, which basically regularizes over correspondence information. And this corresponding information comes from uh, optical flow and uh, long-term tracks. And as a, as a result of this optimization, the feature space respects correspondence. So uh, two features lying on different correspondence, they, are, they will be much closer. And that basically satisfies all the three criteria that we described before. And once we have this optimized feature space, we can then use it in our dense CRF to get our final semantic label output. Let's just see what's the effect of doing feature optimization and not doing it. So on the left side, we do not do the feature optimization. And on the right side, we do. So if you have to look closely, the, result, the segmentation when you do not do feature optimization does not stick. We can look at uh, more closely in a slow motion so if you look on the left side, uh, the segmentation kind of doesn't stick. They kind of move around. While on the right, when you do feature optimization, they stick uh, more properly to the actual object. Now, videos can be arbitrarily long, right? 10,000 frames, 20,000 frames, right? So it doesn't make sense to have interactions between two images which are very far away. They might be actually be seeing a totally different scene. So what should we do then? So what we do is form overlapping set of frames and each of these overlapping set of blocks is a fully connected CF. But we in do inference over them jointly. So let's now look at how uh, the results look like uh, quantitatively on Cambridge. So we have differentiated our method with, using two categories of unaries, both covenant and uh, non covenant and as you can see, our method achieves, achieves state-of-the-art performance in intersection over union. Since the ground truth is not available for every frame, we come up with a novel measure for temporal consistency. So we basically take tracks and see if the labels are consistent or not. And as you can see, our method is both temporally consistent and at the same time, much more accurate. This is how the results look like if you want to see them visually. So 
the bottom right corner is our result. So one important thing to note here is all these methods actually exploit video. See, all these methods are video semantic segmentation method. And as you can see, our method gives much more temporally consistent and accurate. So this is how the results look like compared to single image uh, semantic segmentation methods, which are all these methods are state of the art methods. And as you can see, our method is so temporally consistent. And that proves that actually exploiting video can really improve your semantic segmentation. So also one thing to notice is that even though we are actually optimizing over the video, we still preserve thin objects like lamppost. Since our submission, uh, we also have a new data set called Cityscapes. Uh, and we have also evaluated our method on this new data set. Uh, and we, in the, uh, we have uh, on the validation set of Cityscape, as you can see, our methods improve upon the state of the art, uh, single image semantic segmentation methods, and also a big improvement on the temporal consistency. And this is how it looks like uh, uh, on, on Cityscape. So this is the demo video of Cityscape. Uh, one small nugget is that uh, this is like 1200 frames, so there are actually 2.5 billion pixels and we are doing the inference over 2.5 billion pixels. So uh, with this I want to end my talk and I want to say that uh, the code will be available and uh, I can take questions now. <laughs>